Welcome to 32 Bar Cut, the show, a show where we talk with our friends about what it's like to be a performer. Today on 32 Bar Cut, the show, we are sitting down with Wesley Taylor. It's time to welcome on our guest, my favorite by far, a Broadway star, Wesley Taylor. You may have seen him in Bikini Bottom or giving his roommate a hard time in Indoor Boys, but today this Broadway star is gracing us with his presence and sitting down and talking with us about what his life has been like to be a performer and a writer. Welcome to the show, Wesley Taylor. Yay! Hi! Hi. <laughs> I loved your musical intro. <laughs> Thank you. Austin wrote that and we sang it together in our little makeshift studio over here. I'm gesturing towards it because it is directly in front of me. <laughs> it's adorable. <laughs> Thank you. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Although, I'm... how are you? What a loaded question. Right? I know. I know. Well, when I say how are you, I really do mean how are you? Because I know everything is very different from how it was about a year ago. Um, yeah. we, before we started this interview, we were just chatting about how you were in rehearsals for Assassins and then boom, yeah. you know, so how are you? Yeah, I mean, it, again, it's, it's, I'm a little overwhelmed when I hear that question um, because it really makes you step back and think about it um, at, this, at this point in time. Um, I'm doing well though. Uh, I really am. I think one thing about 2020 is that it really forced us all to take stock of our lives and like um, figure out what really matters and our priorities and, you know, healthy perspective. Um, so I, I'm doing well. How are you? Really? How am I really? Yeah. Um, I feel like today's a good day. I only had one little moment, um, uh -oh. but I think it's a, I think it is a, a day by day thing. Yeah. Um, and I agree with you and you, we're, we're having to take stock in what's important and what to prioritize. And I feel like I haven't done that in a very long time because mm -hmm. I'm very career focused and very career driven. Mm -hmm. So my family takes a back seat and important events take a back seat. And now I'm like, wait, was that really the best choice? Right. You know, do I not want my nieces and nephews to know who I am? You know, so yeah. I'm, trying to work through that and what it looks like and, and trying to reconnect with people that I haven't connected with in a while. But for today, I, I feel good. I feel good. good. I'm good. excited you to get great. to talk with you. Yeah, same. You I'm look excited. great. Thank you. I see you're Little. doing a longer hair now. Yeah, it's just fully growing it out. You know, why, not? <laughs> why not? Why not? I have no reason to cut it. Right. It's like winning COVID. Why not? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so I've been doing some research on you because I like to research uh -oh. all of our guests, even the people like I know have known for years. I do a little research. Uh -oh. And um, in my researching, I found that you have been basically performing your whole life. Is this true? <sighs> pretty much. Yeah. Got bit, got bit with the bug pretty early on. Yeah. So, um, so when you say bit with the bug, as a as a young performer, you know, in a in an art school and performing and everything, maybe in community theater, I don't know, summer programs. When did you decide that that's what you want to do for a living? Uh, <laughs> way too early. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, my my mom was a music teacher, so um, music was a part of our lives. When I say our my, my sister and I, you know, we were always she was always putting us in church, singing singing in front of the church crowd. Um, and we were always, you know, around the piano, like singing, practicing the piano, music theory, that kind of thing. Um, but beyond music, I knew that I just got drunk off the sound of people laughing at me or like giving me any sort of attention. So um, I knew that I wanted to be like from a very early age, I wanted to be an actor. And so I uh, asked my parents to get me signed with an agency. I, I lived in Orlando, Florida. So it wasn't LA, it wasn't New York City, but there was entertainment, there was yeah. an industry there. And, um, and you know, they got me an agent. I was signed by the age of nine doing the, uh, you know, auditions for, you know, commercials and voiceovers and industrials and community theater, dinner theater, did, did all of that stuff. But, um, you know, it's funny that you call me a child actor because I mean, yeah, I guess you didn't say it. it was like the idea of child actor. Like I, I looked to Macaulay Culkin, Macaulay Culkin and like Jonathan Taylor Thomas. And I was like, 
just so jealous of their Hollywood lives that I would just harass my parents. Like, can, can we please pay attention to my gifts and move <laughs> to Hollywood so that uh, my dreams aren't stifled? And they were like, you're a child. Um, <laughs> like, just be a normal kid. Come on. Don't end up on drugs. Like, you know. <laughs> don't don't go that wayward route of every other child star. And in hindsight, I'm very glad that I'm grateful that they they put me through school in a normal sort of childhood, whatever that means. <laughs> I um I think that's important because yeah, the grass is always greener, right? You see mm. what someone else is up to, especially when you're a kid. It's very black and white when you're a kid. No, you do this, you do that, you get this done. That's but right. It's not that's that right. cut and dry for sure. That's that's right. Yeah. I mean, I always wanted to to perform because I liked that the the feeling of singing and dancing and making people laugh and stuff. But I, I don't know that I was taking it all that seriously. You know, I just wanted mm -hmm. to be famous. I wanted to be a star, you know, mm -hmm. but I wasn't like, I want to be good, you know. And it wasn't until maybe high school, I went to an arts high school and, and, and then I was like, no, I actually want to maybe be the best that I can be at this and maybe learn and maybe study and maybe, you know, go to acting school, you know, what, what would that mean? So, so, um, do you still play piano now? I don't. Oh, I feel big, your it's, pain. It, it, yeah. It's a big regret actually. And I have, I, I am not someone who, who believes in no regrets. I definitely have regrets in mm -hmm. my life. And that doesn't mean that like regrets don't teach you things and, and make you stronger people, but I do have regrets. And one of them is that I, I didn't keep up with it. We had to play an hour every day. We had to practice and we had lessons. And then like after six years of that, um, they were like, okay, you can either continue with this instrument or switch to another instrument. And I chose the drums, which was a really dumb idea. <laughs> like, cause I grew tired of that after a couple of years and I wasn't very good, but I was good at the piano and I should have stuck with it like my sister did. Oh, well. I feel your pain. I took yeah. piano lessons from nine until through college. And then I stopped. And oh. I can't. And I was, but I actually, I was never brilliant. You know, yeah. I had a lot of enthusiasm, but I wasn't a strong sight reader. Um, I really had to practice. My technique wasn't great. And mm -hmm. I really didn't start lear learning theory until I was... Uh, senior in high school. So like my oh, foundation- so you were just sort of like ear, ear, ear playing? Or? No, no, no. I, I had a proper teacher. She just wasn't really teaching us oh, a lot of theory. Um, gotcha. So I was learning like chordal structures, really learning chordal structures in um, uh, theory class in high school. But yeah, Got it. Got yeah, it. I feel your pain. I, I can definitely play my parts. I can learn my music. I can, you know, one e and a two e and a, you know, write right. down the rhythms, but- I yeah. cannot accompany myself. Like, wouldn't that be so brilliant? Oh, yes. You know, it would, some... save, would save money, yeah. would save time. <laughs> yeah. It would It would be, you know, I think that, you know, I'm a writer and, and I would be more inclined to write a musical, mm -hmm. you know, whereas, whereas I, that scares me. You know, I stay away from music. Yeah. You know? I've wanted, I've actually wanted to talk to you a lot about your writing. Should we yeah. jump, should we jump into that now? Sure. Yeah. Because um, so at, while I was doing my research, um, <laughs> <laughs> I came across the the plays that you've already written. You've written well, at least on Wikipedia, according to Wikipedia, you've written four plays. One of which you already did a developmental lab for. And so I was curious what that process was like to put on your own your own workshop, your own lab. Yeah. Well. Um... It's funny. I, I was always writing, you know, like e I went to drama school and like that was a conservatory and you didn't have like too many academic, you had to take three years of academics in the morning for like an hour to get your BFA. And so I was like taking playwriting and I was taking, you know, and I was writing sketches and I was writing, you know, when I moved to New York, I was doing web series and I was, you know, and and it was really a hobby. It was really a, a creative outlet for me. But it, I, I, again, I, I just did not take it seriously. Um, and uh, and then the web series, the, the 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 second web series I did, it could be worse. Um, I sold to Hulu, 
And so the first moment wow. that I, I got a paycheck for my writing, I was like, oh, maybe I should take this seriously. Maybe I should practice this more. Maybe I sh this should become more of a daily thing. Um, and so then it did become more of a thing. And, you know, I had these short plays, you know, for, I would, I would um, collaborate with the Actors Fund and they would, you know, give me a venue like New World Stages. Uh, and I would just give them all the proceeds of like putting up a reading of a staged reading of my short plays and be able to, you know, fundraise for the Actors Fund while they gave me a space and sort of a showcase for my writing, you know? One of the stipulations was that I, you know, uh, stunt the, the roles so that they could make their money back. So, you know, I called on the fancy favors from the jobs I had done as an actor, you know, and recruiting Nathan Lane and Deborah Messing and Stocker Channing and, and people who I knew could could bring, you know, an audience. An audience. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that started that. I, I was learning a lot about producing and development you know, within the selling of the internet entities, I, I sold a, a short form script and, and things like that. All this to say that it led to like four years ago, um, collaborating with Alex Wise. I don't know if you know Alex, but um, he's become my writing partner. And we developed this, this series, Indoor Boys, over the last few years, um, which started out really as just, again, a creative outlet because we were frustrated um, with what we were doing at the time. And then it got bigger and bigger and, and, and got away from us a little bit, just got more expensive and, and got more eyeballs on it. And then suddenly, you know, it's got an Emmy nomination and it's getting acquired by Here TV and now it's on Prime and all that. So, um, you know, the writing has really grown. And especially in the world of a 2020 pandemic, like when the acting career took a pause, because the writing was always taking the back seat to the acting. And once the acting career paused, like I've become a full-time writer. Like there's no way around it. I, I, I sit down at this desk for four or five hours a day with Alex over Zoom and we write. And we've, we've pumped out a few scripts just in the last year, uh, some full length stuff. So it's, um, I, it's the silver lining that we've been able to be very productive during this time as, as much as this time has sucked, you know. Absolutely. It's like um, we're all on sabbatical, a forced yeah. sabbatical. And now you have to really uh, hone in on, on uh, sure, your passions, but uh, what what are we going to make of ourselves? You know, you got to get a little resourceful. Yeah. You have to figure out how you can continue to be inspired and mm -hmm. continue to be challenged um, and continue to find reasons to, to get out of the bed and, and put art out into the ether. Absolutely. I, um, I've been watching Indoor Boys oh, <laughs> and on it's it? hilarious. I am on season two, episode five, I think. Um, so I don't want to spoil it for anyone that is definitely going to go run and watch it now that we're talking about it. But that show is hilarious. Thank you. It is Please the, keep watching. Oh my gosh. I, I, I'm, if I had had more time before we came on to talk today, I would have yeah. like finished the whole thing. But then yeah. I was like, oh, well, we can't really, really talk about it because I'm going to spoil it for someone. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so Nate and Luke are hilarious and Thank complicated you. in just the perfect kind of ways. And I love it. I love it. And it's fun too, because I mean... I've only spent just a week with you and now the time that we're spending today, but yeah. I find you to be a really kind and giving person, <laughs> but here you are again playing the villain, you know, <laughs> and it's hilarious. I mean, uh -huh. it's really great writing. And I love that you and Alex decided to make your own opportunities and, you know, you talk about being frustrated or being in a place in your life where you were frustrated with how things were going, whatever that meant. And yeah. you, you took that frustration and you used it for your good. And now it's yeah. it's snowballed into something really incredible. So yeah. congratulations. Well, it's also, you. thank you. Thank you. It's also about like, I'm a very um, work oriented person. I'm a workhorse. And mm -hmm. I found someone who's like just as much of a workaholic as I am, if not more. And we we figured out within the span of a few years how to really meld our voices and like kind of finish each other's sentences. 
Um, but that's one of the reasons why we jumped in in the first place is this industry doesn't always feel like that in terms of efficiency. Like, mm. obviously, especially during a time like this, but like even cut to, you know, rewind four years ago when we were, we found ourselves in Los Angeles and he was doing a soap opera and I was, I had just sold a script, but it was just taking forever to develop it with the people in LA. And I think that there is a, a, a mutual frustration that we have in, in relying on other people <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, not everyone enjoys work. A lot of people enjoy the perks of work but they would rather have a three-day weekend and get out on their yacht and uh, experience all the advantages and the blessings of being successful without like really enjoying the process of what made them successful. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, when you're waiting on correspondence of like someone to answer an email and it takes a week and a half, you know, I have no patience for that. So <laughs> one of the reasons why we are so productive is because we don't have patience. <laughs> and so we take our negative traits and, and try to spin them into positive productive traits. Um, well, I'm glad that you found someone to match that because I, I would imagine if, if one of you couldn't match that, this, this pairing wouldn't have been successful. <laughs> no. And in fact, I have, you know, obviously attempted to, to put a lot of creative ventures out into the universe before I met Alex and, you know, some more successful than others, some partnerships more successful than others, some collaborations more, you know, it was really important and, and special when I found Alex because it is a creative marriage. You know, it, it very much is 50, 50 and, and you hold each other accountable. And sometimes you have to pick each, you pick up the slack one day. If you're feeling a little bit more um, on your cylinders than the other person, you know, it's, it's, it's such a partnership. It's a dance that you're like constantly navigating. Um, but it, but it's nice to have that accountability partner too. Um, and it's provided structure for me too. Cause before, before Alex, when I would be, when I would write, it would be all about when inspiration struck. So it would be like, if you get an idea at 11 o'clock at night, you are not going to sleep that night because you're going to write through the night until it gets out of your head. But with Alex, it's been wonderful because it lends itself to a nine to five structural job. Like I can, I don't know. It's like um, that inspiration is, is structured, <laughs> which sounds like uh, counterintuitive to creativity, but it actually helps. Absolutely. I've heard that before from writers. I, I do not consider myself a writer, but I really love this sci-fi fantasy writer, um, Octavia Butler. And okay. she has a collection of short stories called something blood and something it's up there but um she has a uh, an essay that she wrote about writing and how it needs structure and that you do need to wake up every day and write and yeah. not be the kind of writer that only writes when inspired because that's yeah. not that doesn't prove to be successful and you won't get better right. she says something like that and i'm that's misquoting right. this really poorly because I read it like three years ago and I'm, it's just coming to my mind now as yeah, you're speaking. It's real. Yeah. yeah. If you like sci-fi, check Octavia Butler out. I mean, I will. Octavia Butler. Okay, yeah. Good yeah. Yeah. She's, she's, she's awesome. Um, so I am also curious about your, your venture, uh, into New York living, you know, um, I'm from Georgia, so I know what it's like to come from the South and uh, move to the big city. And it can yeah. be a little daunting, but I'm sure. imagining young Wesley was probably <laughs> so ready because you already had your sights on the stars as a child. So now you're like, let's go. So yeah, did you, oh, I, <laughs> I, I never like? looked back. I never looked back. It was, I was, well, first of all, I grew up in Orlando, Florida, uh, which is a ridiculous place to grow up. You know, um, uh, I, went to high school across the street from Universal Studios. I worked at Disney World. I did all the things. Um, and it felt, you know, as soon as I went to drama school in North Carolina and experienced a little bit of originality, you know, mom and pop shops and things that weren't, it just wasn't, in Orlando, everything was corporate. Everything was chain franchise, restaurants, yeah. franchise and stuff like that. So um, I definitely didn't miss Florida. Like I didn't, like no shame. Like, sorry if I'm offending 
all of the Floridian listeners, but, but I didn't miss Florida. Um, I didn't have that real like homesick passion for it. North Carolina sort of became like a new home for me, but I, I knew from an early age that New York city was where I was destined to live. It was like, you know, my, my parents actually met, um, and went to college in Nyack, New York, upstate. Okay. Um, and that's where they, they met. And then we, they moved down South when we were babies. So um, they had a connection to New York and we went up there when I was a kid and, and then, you know, went to the city to see a show, you know, Beauty and the Beast or something. And as soon as I got bitten with the bug, you know, I, we would come back to New York as a family on our, at least like family vacations. And I would just give my dad like a list of shows that we needed to see. <laughs> and like, Cause they didn't know anything about theater, but I was like, we will be seeing Night Mother with Brenda Blethyn and Edie Falco, The Crucible <laughs> with Laura Linney and Liam Neeson. We, you know, I was like 12. But, um, but you know, I, I, I was obsessed with New York. I was obsessed with the culture. And I, I, I dreamed of one day living there in a high rise, looking out on the Hudson, going to you know, my Broadway show. And you know, it was, that was the dream. Um, so yeah, I always knew I was gonna, I was gonna go. My fiance, Isaac, was born and raised in Greensboro, North Carolina. And the first time he ever moved, you know, he went to drama school at North Carolina as well. So the first time he ever lived away from home was when he moved to the city right after college. So that was a, a much bigger culture shock for him Absolutely. and a much bigger adjustment for a human being because I had gone to New York so much growing up. Not that we were like rolling in money, but like even in college, I would like buy $20 China bus tickets to, to drive five hours up and, uh, you know, stand in student rush, you know, front row or standing room or whatever to see as much Broadway shows as I could. So yeah, it was always part of the plan. All right. So it sounds like you moving to New York was not daunting. You just no. got off the plane, walked into your high rise, looking over the Hudson. <laughs> Definitely didn't walk into my high rise. <laughs> Definitely walked into like a, what do they call them? Those, um, those those apartments where you have to like go through the bedrooms to get to your bedroom. A shotgun. A railway apartment. Oh, railway. Yeah, yeah that's railway it. Apartments. Railway. Yeah. yeah. I lived with like four of my college roommates in a Brooklyn like railway apartment. You know, but you do it though. That's what you do yeah. because it's it's not really about living in style at that point. It's just I need to have a place. I need shelter so that I can go on my auditions and make right. this happen. That's right. That's right. I knew it would be tough, but the 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 pounding of the pavement was a romantic concept to me. You know, yeah. it was all sort of like a poetic experience of like struggling, you know. Yeah, you well it sounds like you welcomed it like um like that uh the like not like La Boheme, but yeah, you know, you see these artists and they don't mind being poor because they're living yeah. this the life yeah, yeah, this, that they want. Yeah. Um, so your your Broadway debut was Rock of Ages, which yeah, is pretty awesome. cool. You originate the role of Franz. Yeah. So uh, what was that like? Did you do an out-of-town run beforehand? Did you join the project at another time? It was ridiculous. Yeah, it was a, it was a very stupid, like, silly Broadway debut. It was the gift that kept giving. It was, it's kind of a blur when I think back on it because I I'm sure I took it for granted, you know, in the sense that, it happened very early after I graduated where there was this off-Broadway show and I was going to go on tour with Greece. Like I had, I had gotten this national tour as Sunny in Greece and I was about to hit the road for a year. And this off-Broadway show, um, which I didn't, you know, I, I have to say, I had just done a lot of Shakespeare in, in college. I, I think I, I was feeling like, <laughs> above a jukebox musical, you know, like this off Broadway, like eighties, trashy bubblegum sort of thing. I, I was just like, Oh, this is not going to be successful. You know, like this is going to close like immediately. It's not going to be it's very low brow, you know, cause I was a snob. I was a conservatory snob at the time. <laughs> um, but my agents were like, no, you should stay in town and do this. You know, you should, you know, cause if you go on tour, like, you know, you disappear for a year. So yeah. stay in town and do this. Even if it doesn't do well, more people will see you in it, you know? So um, it was good advice, obviously. Um, it was 
you know, this, the, the thing that blew everyone's expectations away. I mean, it transferred to Broadway. It got great reviews. It ran for six years, you know. So, um, yeah, I just I had no expectations for that show. And it just kept exceeding those lack of expectations. Um, so, yeah. That's the best. That's the best way for a Broadway debut, right? That uh, that you have no expectations, so you can't be disappointed, and then yeah. it turns out to be something incredible for you. I was so lucky. Yeah, it was such. I had this eleven o'clock number that hit me with your best shot, and it was just like such a stupid little gift. You know, it was it was really a nice nice time. I would have loved to have seen you do that because listening to your voice and the reading that we did together, you have such an amazing rocker voice. And I don't know, I, I don't know if it's because like to hear you speak, you're kind of like a high baritone type of timbre. But when you add that to like a rock sound with your range, it's like a rich powerhouse. You have you're very you're very kind. I will say, just <laughs> uh, it, in the reading that I sang, that the <laughs> the reading that we did together, the twelve, all of my music was lowered. Just so you know, it was all taken down <laughs> a, a full. <laughs> I <laughs> wish I, that they had taken the mine down. <laughs> yeah. Well, you could have asked. I just flat out asked. Yeah, I, I will like, do that next time. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty much what I do every process, every <laughs> single job I ever get. Um, no, I'm a baritone, tr like true, a true baritone. Um, I have a tenor note or two, but that's because I've had to figure out how to croak them out because, you know, musicals aren't written for baritones. They just aren't, you know, for... For, for men, if you're not a tenor, you're not going to have a, a career in musical theater if you want to, you know, have lead roles. So, so you know, it's about navigating that and figuring it out and playing supporting characters. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, the composers don't write for, for low voices. You know, it's just not exciting for the audience. Um, so, so I see an opening for you to collaborate with a composer with the witty writing that you have. And then make sure that you have a leading man who's a baritone so you can start changing this whole narrative. Because it's That's unfair. Right. It's unfair. It's I don't unfair. think that leading ladies should always be sopranos either. It's really unfair. Look, Leslie, uh, you, I'm sure you know Leslie Margarita, but she does a huge campaign on this, uh, on like stop shaming singers for not having an upper, you know, for having that higher register. You know, mm -hmm. like there are gorgeous singers who live in the basement. Um you know, alto women should not be shamed for not being sopranos. You know, it's a, it's a, it's its own thing. It is. It's interesting that um, I don't know if it's a human quality. I mean, I'm sure it is that we we uh, admire and validate extremes, right? Mm. So if you were a you know a basso, it's like singing you know notes that you only hear the piano play or the bass yeah. play, then you would be celebrated. But yeah. if and if you're you know squeaking out, well probably not squeaking out, but floating out high E's and F's, then everyone is just so excited. Yeah. But you can have an amazing, beautiful timbre and just sing, you know, an octave and a half. What's yeah. wrong with that? That's right. <laughs> I see nothing wrong with it. I think um yeah, I'm I'm right there with her. Let's it's let's funny. I you know I, I I was joking before, but I am serious that almost every process I go into, I ask for for things to be lowered. And I know it disappoints people because I know they want it in its original sort of experience, mm -hmm. but um, almost never do people say no. There was one time I did a, the Who's Tommy at Kennedy Center and I ended up figuring out how to, how to sing it, but I played Cousin Kevin and he has some really high music. And I remember because there was only 10 days of rehearsal, you know, before you're doing the show. And so I was like, I don't have a rehearsal process. I don't have time to get this conditioned in my voice and mm -hmm. like to be able to sing this without bleeding, you know, like, how am I going to do this? Yeah. But they weren't, they weren't going to budge. Um, most, really? most, most people let you lower their stuff, but the, the who just, you know, they were very precious about their music. And I, you know, uh, who am I to, to 
try to change like that original thing. But I remember being just terrified because it was the first time I had been met with a no for changing the music. And uh, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, you know, get through this, pull this off, you yeah. know? And I, I, I think I did, but maybe out of fear and just like, <laughs> just cause I had to. Um, but yeah, I, I even went into assassins and, and, and got them to, to take it down half a step. Um, cause it was a super high part. And Sondheim, when I met him, the first thing he said to me was like, who are you playing again? And I was like, Zengara. And he was like, be careful. It's so loud and so high. Protect your voice. Pace yourself. And I was like, Jesus, that doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> first thing Sondheim tells me. Um, so. Oh man. Yeah. I, um, as we were talking before we got started, I, I, I was telling you that I lost my voice that day we did the presentation. Um, and I, it did was you, actually- Did the, you take some prednisone? Did you, what did you do? It was the biggest loss I've had. I, I was oh. actually shocked. I started the the presentation at 10 a.m. And when we finished at noon, thank God, you know, for John and how quickly he's just like, he's like, yeah. okay, we're done. Everybody leave. But yeah. um, I couldn't even like say hello to a friend I ran into outside of- uh, what was it at Pearl or Ripley? It doesn't matter. Yeah. But I, um, I had to go to voice therapy and I had to work with a teacher on yeah. getting everything like back. And I had a couple more workshops that summer that I had to do. And I did have to take prednisone shots and, um, just kind of fake it because there's such a stigma around losing your voice that it's yeah. like, you've done something wrong or whatever. I think for me, when that happened, it was simply because I was singing Kiss Me Kate and then singing rock music during the day and my voice just couldn't yeah. take the the switch. I yeah. was asking well, also, too much. <laughs> not to mention just the nature of double duty. I mean, yeah. not just about different styles. I mean, Adrian, you were doing eight shows a week. Like, <laughs> you know, so when you're doing eight shows a week and you're double dutying and doing a full workload during the day of like music, like yeah. belting your face off, like, yeah, that's a recipe for disaster. I remember every time I was in a Broadway show and I did something outside, like extracurricular, I feel like every time I would lose my voice or almost lose my voice or something. Or you get sick or you just get really worn down and then you end up having to call out of a show. That's why stage managers really don't want you to take on workshops and, and readings because they know you're going to eventually call out. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, it's... It's hard to sit in a long run of a show and and not participate in in new work and development because, you know, you got to keep your creative juices flowing. So yeah. those are like you know blessings, obviously, to to work on something else. But the the heavy vocal demands uh, are not forgiving. No, and I couldn't say no. I couldn't say no because I was excited to do the reading. And, yeah, yeah. and so I was like, I'm not, I'm not saying no to this. I'm going to make it work. And yeah. the, it's funny, you, you can have as much willpower in the world, but your body is your body. Your body can only handle so much. You that's can, right. Yeah. You know, that's interesting to think about this, this year that we've had off the boards and, um, or, uh, you know, not performing in general. And, you know, in some regards, I'm like, when I start singing in the car or like if I have to sing for some virtual responsibility, I'm like, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> like I, I don't do that. Like, it's not what I do. I don't warm up. I don't sing, you know, I sing in the car, but like, I'm not doing this every day and your voice is a muscle, which means it needs to be conditioned, mm -hmm. you know, it needs to be in practice for it to produce what it used to produce. But at the same time, what a blessing to have time for healing too, because the commercialism of New York City theater means that you are always uh, overextended, I think, if you want to make a living. Mm -hmm. You know, like if, if you're lucky, you're doing eight shows a week while you're doing a workshop, while you're doing a concert, while you're, you know, and your voice wasn't designed for that. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you know, popping steroids, you're, you know, you're, you're working, you're, you're, you're working past inflammation. Like it's just not good. And so, you know, it's nice to take a year off of needing steroids and, and, you know, pushing yourself to the brink. Absolutely. I, um, 
I think right along with that is there's a mentality that if you're not doing all these things, then you're not a hard worker or you're not taking it seriously or, you know, you're just coasting. But um, yeah. I really respect actors that that say no because they know it's too much. Mm. I've had such a hard time in the past saying yeah. no because I, I want to take on every opportunity. Um, but and, that, and that yeah. also goes with um, auditions. You know, yeah. like your only power as an actor is to say no. <laughs> and like, we forget that. I don't know. Well, first of all, we love working. I mean, otherwise you wouldn't be an actor at the, at our age, mm -hmm. you know, you wouldn't commit to make believe in your adult life for as long as you have, unless you really loved it, unless there was no other way around it, yeah. you know? So you love it. You're committed it's what you've signed up for, subscribed to for life. And you know what I mean? It's like, I just, um, if we say no, if we're not like, if it's not an enthusiastic yes, if you're reading the materials and you don't feel connected or you resonate with it and you're just yes, because you're scared of saying no, you know, you're actually doing yourself a huge disservice because people respect you when you're selective because it means that you have a clear idea of what you want and that's to be respected. I agree. I think, I, I, I think too, um, I don't know if it's upbringing or if it's, if it's just being a black woman, sometimes oh. I feel like saying no is going to cost me later oh. on. You like know, it, like it looks like a bad attitude or something. Yeah. Like it could be a bad attitude or it could be, oh, well, we took a chance on you and you said no. So we're just, you know, we'll never think of you again. And and that right. could all very well be in my head. It might not be real. But yeah. um, I recently, not recently, <laughs> like uh, uh, I, about a year or so ago, uh, did a reading that was eventually going to do it, uh, you know, a run, a tour and then go to Broadway. Mm -hmm. And. I, I thought I thought the project was going to be great, but then when they came back with "Hey, do you want to do it?" I thought no. I, I thought I was like the role that I was in didn't bring me joy, yeah. and I just didn't want to tour for a uh, six months or a year and then come back and do it just for the sake of doing another Broadway show. Yeah. And I do think it's going to be incredible, and it's going to you know knock people's socks off, and it's going to be great. Yeah. I just won't be a part of that. Yeah. And I'm fine with that because I didn't want to do the role. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I, I guess I was thinking, oh, is this director going to hate me or never want to, you know, consider me for something else? Yeah. Uh, and that's just, a, you know, it's a chance you have to take because you can't put your uh, destiny or your career in someone else's hands and and uh, do whatever they want in hopes that they don't blacklist you or, or not want to work with you again. Yeah. Yeah, no, wrong reasons. Yeah. yeah. You really have to listen to yourself in this in this life. I Definitely. think we're realizing that more culturally too. Just like like artists in general are like, no, I need to listen to myself, actually. I need to like follow my instinct here. Definitely. You know? And I yeah. think the the sabbatical we're all taking is making that a little uh clear making that voice clearer. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean just in the sense that like, I mean, I'm sure you relate to this, but like when you're in New York, you, the amount of readings and concerts that you are asked to do on a regular basis, you know, and the concerts are like, you know, 54 Below sings Solange or, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's just, and you feel like you have to keep being visible keep being relevant, mm -hmm. keep being seen and talked about and all these things. And this last year really smacked me in the face for all of that noise mm -hmm. because like, you know, all of a sudden every day you're getting these like virtual requests for charity performances. Uh, can you do this for my theater company? Can you do this for my podcast? Can you do this? I mean, like I'm, happy to do this with you. I enjoy being around you. I, I, you know, but not everything is going to bring me joy. And yeah. I early, early on, I think during all this got 
a lot better at saying no. And it, it also got easier, I think, collectively for the human race to be like, everyone um, is allowed to say no, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> Um, we're all going through our own moment right now yeah. and you don't know where that person is emotionally, financially, mentally, spiritually, you know, there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression, a lot of things happening right now, a lot of displacement, um, and not knowing the future. And, you know, we're going through a sort of international collective trauma, like globally, I think. Yeah. And so there is room for that forgiveness, I think. Um, But I think it's a great thing. Again, just the the shifting of priorities of like, what is important to me? Doing every concert and reading is not important to me. Mm -hmm. I want to do the readings and concerts when I really believe in that creative and I want to help them fully realize their thing. But I don't need for me to constantly be busy scurrying about these things just to like facilitate a facade or like an appearance of being busy or in demand or whatever the hell, you know? You're really speaking to something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's also like just, just in the sense that when you get invited to a screening or premiere or something, you know, this, this thing of like, I have to keep up this illusion of prosperity. I have to like go get a new suit to or go get new clothes, new outfit to wear for this thing, which I'm just going to return the next day. Like, cause I'm not rich, mm-hmm. but I have to make the industry think I'm doing well financially so that they keep hiring me. You know, it's like so messed up. And it really was this year that just like took me down a few pegs and was like, actually, Everyone is actually seeing into each other's homes on a regular basis now. <laughs> like, there's no more facade, you know? Stop hiding behind this illusion, you know? I love that. I, it's interesting that we are... I mean, and I, part of it is social media, too. It makes things mm-hmm. difficult. But I think that to be in a craft where you become someone else or you really Mm. try to find their truth and who they are as a character. Mm. It is uh, interesting that we are living our lives trying to keep up with the Joneses in spite of trying to have truth and realness in what we bring to the stage. Um, But yeah, I remember when I first moved to New York, uh, being a bit overwhelmed by needing to be stylish and walking mm. in, in in walking to and from the stage door i was oh, wow. like oh no this isn't me i don't <laughs> like i don't know how to pull this off i'm tired i just washed orange paint off my face yeah. can i just leave the theater bare face like do i really have to put on another like layer of makeup just so I can do stage door. I really don't want to do this. Like yeah, I remember struggling, God. struggling with that and, and deciding, no, this is how I look. I have on a, a, a scully and a puff coat. And this is how I look. If you want me to sign your, your, your playbill, I'm more than happy to, but this, this is who I am. And it took me a while yeah. to be okay with that. That's real. Yeah. yeah. The stage door culture in general is, I mean, that's a fairly, new age thing because like that that's they weren't dealing with that 30 40 years ago i Absolutely mean it was not. it really has become this new digital age especially um because everyone wants a selfie and mm-hmm. everyone i mean that's more important than the show is like them getting them meeting the person and getting the selfie unfortunately so um it became like a an addendum like a, 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 a an extra part of your job and yeah, I under, I mean, I, <laughs> I hear you. At the same time, of course, I, I grew up, I went to the stage door. You know I went to the stage <laughs> door. So, like, I remember being outside of Take Me Out and meeting Dennis O'Hare after seeing the show twice in one day and being <laughs> like, Dennis, I'm <laughs> writing a paper on, because uh, I was going to that arts high school, so I was like, I'm writing a paper on Richard Greenberg, the playwright of take me out and and the manhattan theater club which was the theater company that put it on could you help me write my paper <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me a business card when you know this is obviously a long time ago because he gave me a, a bit obviously no one would ever do this now 
but he gave me a business card and it had his email on it. Um, I'll never forget. Um, and he was like, you know, shoot me a message. And, and we corresponded like for a few weeks and he helped me write my paper, um, which is so like, like crazy that yeah. that happened. Um, but of course I, because I grew up going to the stage door, of course I want to pay that back and, and, and provide that for people who, you know, who traveled all this way to come see a Broadway show and they want that experience. But when it becomes, I mean, for SpongeBob, that, that stage door turned into <laughs> an extra 30, 45 minutes. I can imagine. And you're like, wow, this is exhausting. And every, every single person in this line wants a selfie. Yeah. And my face hurts and I'm tired and I want to go. And I look like, like if I get tagged in one more sweaty, shiny, disgusting picture of myself, <laughs> you know, like yes. I, I get it, but it's about like, like, how do we, I mean, obviously the stage door culture will probably be reexamined moving forward. It will. It will. I think too, uh, we are living in a, a time where everyone is so accessible mm -hmm. because of social media. And so, um, it seems like this new generation of theater lovers like yourself when you mm -hmm. were, uh, or you still are, I'm sure, but stage dooring as a theater lover, I think that the boundaries aren't as clear as they used mm. to be. And, um, you know, if you have an extroverted child that, that, that shouts out to Dennis O'Hare, please help me write my paper. That's different than, um, 50 kids with the same type yeah. of vigor, um, asking, a asking of you and asking of you. And um, so, yeah, I do think the stage door culture will change just because of COVID and, and, and yeah. um, safety and everything. But just I, like, I don't think that actors will put themselves in that danger anymore. I mean, danger yeah. is maybe dramatic, but <laughs> you know, I, I, if, if theater comes back and all the audience is wearing masks and, you know, I don't think the handshake is coming back, you know, you know, I feel like culture will be different. You yeah. know, society will have to reflect what happened this year. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't know if the stage door will even be a thing for a while. I know the they shut it down. Happen. They did shut it down at the Lion King, I think the last two weeks before yeah. everything came to a close. And we were all relieved because yeah. I was like, I can't tell these kids no. Like, what am, who, am, who am I? I'm not going to tell I these know. kids Isaac no. Was in, Isaac was in rehearsals for or not rehearsals. He was in, um, previews. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was in previews for West side story. And so like, you know, the stage door was still, it was like their second month of previews before, or no, they had just opened, they had just opened West side and it was like two weeks after opening. And so, you know, he still has a lot of friends coming to the show and family people that he knows like traveling in to see the show. And he was going to the stage door and I got so upset with him for doing the stage door. Because as soon as that usher at, what was it? The, the Hirschfeld? The booth. Or was it the booth? Mm -hmm. As soon as that usher tested positive, I was like, it's only a matter of time. It's done. We've, yeah, it's done. We're all going to get shut down. So stop stage touring. Yeah. And I mean, the, uh, the ushers, like, okay, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, people come to New York and they see more than one show. Mm -hmm. The ushers move from theater to theater. So, and and they hand out playbills or whatever. So I was just thinking, this is a very, very, very easy way <laughs> for this yeah. to spread. And I was, I after that announcement, um, I was ready to not come back. But I didn't think it was going to be like this. Yeah, yeah, we thought it was going to be like four weeks off. Yeah, four weeks three, off, four weeks. maybe two months. This, this was, this, what we're experiencing now is unimaginable. No, yeah, historical. I, I mean, if you would have told me, <laughs> <laughs> because what? So yeah, let's rewind to the pandemic at the very beginning when we were trying to figure out what it was, and Isaac was in eight shows a week. I was in second week of rehearsals for Assassins. He gets shut down, and he's like in the apartment without the show, and I still have rehearsals because off Broadway. We were still rehearsing for another week mm -hmm. because Off Broadway was still allowed to convene because it was 500 seats or less. Um, but then eventually we got shut down too. But in that time, I was like, "Why don't you go fly down and visit your family?" Because you wouldn't get to for a while if you were doing the show. Yeah. You know, you're 
contracted for a year. You get one vacation a week. Like, why don't you go see your family? This is probably going to be a minute and we'll see how long I'm here. You know, maybe I'll go down and join you. So assassins gets shut down and I, I drive down (laughs) and we think we're going to be at his parents place for maybe like three or four weeks cut to seven months later we're still (laughs) under his parents roof sleeping in his childhood bedroom (laughs) and and then we so so we decide it doesn't make a lot of sense to go back to new york but we can't be here anymore we cannot we're fully (laughs) grown adults we cannot be here um so we moved into a house in greensboro and now we live in a house, you know, like four times the, the size of our Harlem apartment um, for a fourth of the price. Um, nice. And, and, you know, but if you would have told me a year ago that I would be moving to North Carolina <laughs> <laughs> after living with my in-laws for half a year, I would have punched you in the face. Like, I would have just... <laughs> like, no way. Stop lying to me. I mean... But we've all figured out how to make do in our own ways, I suppose. Yeah. And now you're like living the life of a writer. Don't they all go somewhere, you know, secluded yeah. and there's yeah. mountains and trees and brooks? And well, just it's really interesting. Yeah, because it's a really nice quality of life down here. And the weather is beautiful. Nature, it's gorgeous. There's a lot of greenery. It's just very green. It's very... I don't know. It's refreshing. And New York can be pretty suffocating yes. and dirty. And um, so it's actually been quite lovely and just more silver lining. Like when would I ever have a chance to like really get to know his family in this way that I have this year? Um, when would I ever get that chance to like take a break from the hustle and bustle of, of, you know, pounding the pavement, the hustle, the, just the grind of it all, you know, mm-hmm. and, and how soulless that can feel. And reconnecting to the earth and to, like, each other. And, you know, he's been able to audition um, and book off Zoom and some self-tapes. And I've been able to, like, <laughs> make money as a writer, actually, virtually. Um, in addition to my projects with Alex, you know, I, I was on a writer's room um a zoom writer's room for a show and um you know i just if you can figure out how to be resourceful and like stay creative and and thrive make some money why not why not why would i ever go back (laughs) yeah hopefully eventually broadway comes back and, and and we pursue theater again but you know for now i don't really miss it I miss you. I miss my friends. I miss like, I miss going to the bar. I miss going to the, to the theater. I miss seeing shows. I miss, you know, the drinks. I miss the hangs. I miss the the social nature of being in New York, but without the culture, without the dining and the theater and all of that, like, do I really want to go back? No. Yeah. I think, um, what we've noticed too, Austin and I, in this experience, because we we also did our stint with the in-laws. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were with Austin's folks from March. Uh, did we leave in March? Yeah, we left in March. From March until June. And then we were with my parents from June until August. We okay. stayed a shorter time with my parents. Um, but yeah. And then we came back to New York. We moved out of our one bedroom into a two bedroom because our building was holding like uh, really, really nice deals. And uh, so that has been a godsend. We would not have survived a one bedroom. Wouldn't have survived it. We can't work, you know, with, you know, self tapes every other day. How? So this has been, we have a, a, a master bedroom that we kind of turned this, the space I'm in now we turn into an office, which has been really right. great. But right. like you were speaking to why go back? Why, you know? And I think for me, what I realized is that I was always worried about what's next. What's next. I need to be booked. I need to be able to pay my bills. What's next. I need to stay relevant. And um, I think that that's, what's gone away is that yeah. I don't have that desire to, um, 
book the next thing. I am fulfilled by sitting down and talking with friends about their lives and trying to inspire young folks and give them some insight into what it's like to really be a performer. And I'm fulfilled by getting to try new meals and and eat dinner with my husband every night. And I'm fulfilled yeah. just by, I don't know, a lot of things that I lost sight of for a very long time. Yeah. We were not um, allowing ourselves to get a dog in New York uh, because we were so busy and we were doing so many, you know, the eight shows a week lifestyle is not conducive to, to raising a puppy and all that. And we got down here and we got a puppy. You got a puppy? I what, sure did. What kind of puppy? What breed? You know, we don't know because we rescued, but they mm-hmm. say they say he's a Carolina dog, um, which which like when you Google that, you know, some people call it a, a American dingo, um, but it's like an original species uh, kind of dog to America, like like in the Carolinas. Wow. Um, yeah. So he's beautiful. Um, I wish I could show you a picture right now. He's right now. He's in his crate sleeping, taking a nap. He just got a, <laughs> uh, a nice time at the dog park today. So What's he's his worn name? Out. His name is Scrappy. Scrappy. Scrappy do. Oh, oh, I love man. that. I, ju- I just woke Did him up. Did you woke up? <laughs> <laughs> his ears went whoop. Um, but yeah, he's uh, he's just a little over a year old and. Uh, He's really enriched our lives, I have to say. I mean, really, you know, something that, that is always um, helpful in taking attention off of yourself is putting attention in someone else, and, you know, something something else to take care of and, and raise. Uh, some some try with children. <laughs> we, we decided to start with animals. Yeah, we have, uh, we have Bella, who's a lab mix. We got her oh. when we were still in Chicago. And... Uh, she, our whole lives are different with her. Like everything yeah. is about her and what she needs. Okay. And um, she is, she, she used to be a handful because we got her when she was three. And yeah. um, she, we had to do a lot of retraining and getting her, you know. But now she's really lovely and like doesn't go after people when we're walking down the sidewalk. So it's, nice. it's great. Yeah. Nice. Dogs yeah. are v- very enriching and they love you and they know when you, they, when you need them and... Yeah. Yeah. And, and also like, you know, now part of the equation in terms of where we go next and and where we park, you know, because I I have to say, I have a hard time picturing him in New York. I mean, I could see like Brooklyn, if we, we go get more space in Brooklyn, Mm -hmm. but he is such a country dog. He's such an outdoorsy animal. Um, He's just like waiting to be let outside every day, all day. So I, I don't know about being cooped up in, in, on the Island, you know, Yeah. but maybe prospect park or, you know, park slope or something. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. We're in Brooklyn. Bella loves the yeah. park. Yeah. It, yeah. it helps. It definitely helps having the park nearby. Yeah. Um, we'll see. I really, before I let you go, do you want to stay around for the curtain call? Sure. Let's do it. Okay, awesome. Because I, I really wanted to get into uh, your time with SpongeBob, for at least for this first segment, so our, our listeners yeah. and viewers can hear about that. But you uh, were a part of this smash hit SpongeBob the Musical, and um, or SpongeBob SquarePants the Musical. And yeah. I was a huge SpongeBob fan in high school. I'm, I'm sure I'm aging myself, but whatever. And... Um, so much so that I had like a tie and a SpongeBob wow. tie and like socks and everything. But I, wow. I mean, as as you can probably tell by how I'm talking, I wasn't very popular in high school. I just yeah. kind of kept to myself. <laughs> you <laughs> make such a great Sandy, though. Oh well, thank you, thank you. But yeah. I really, I I thought the show was so fun and quirky yeah. and imaginative. You know, the, the you you walk into the theater and you are immediately transformed into Bikini Bottom which is yeah. really cool. And yeah. um, yet again, you are playing the villain, which mm-hmm. was really fun to watch too. So what was your experience like with SpongeBob? Uh, one of the best jobs I've ever had in the city. Um, you know, I just, I believed in the show. I really believed in its message. I believed in its just unapologetic creativity and imagination. And uh you know, I had been off the boards for a handful of years because um, Adam's family was, yeah, it, it had been a while. And so I, I think I appreciated it more than I did in my early 20s because um, I think I just, 
sounds so arrogant and obnoxious, but in my early 20s, I did expect it. I expected it. And I was just like, yeah, this is the way that my career should be going. And this makes sense. <laughs> Whereas when I was older and sort of had more of a taste of how the career really goes, um, I was like, wow, this is special. You know, this is really not, not, not many people get to do this. And this is really special and I need to appreciate this. And I just love the cast and I had such respect for Tina Landau, our director. Um, I just thought she was brilliant and um, I just felt really safe with her. I trusted every step of her process. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I had a, just such a great time doing that show. That is awesome. I think it's important to feel safe in the hands of your director. And I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because if you, um, if you don't feel safe or you don't feel like you can trust them, then there's always going to be this question that the show isn't what it could be, or, um, you know, am I, is what I'm doing working, you know, right. like you need to be able to trust the, the, the person at the helm of it all so That's that right. you can feel like you, the work you're putting out is, is decent and good. And you can feel happy yeah. to go to work every day. Yeah. Big time. So we are going to move into our stage door round where I ask you a couple of questions that you might get at the stage door. Are you uh -oh. ready? <laughs> okay. So what do you love about being a performer and what do you absolutely hate? Okay. Well, what I love um, is that surge of electricity that runs through your body. It's sort of an unparalleled feeling that you only get as a performer who's connected with their audience or, or just, you know, if you're resonating with the material, if you're connected to what you're doing, there's no greater feeling than that live gratification, just like the chemical feeling and that relationship with the audience. Um, what I hate, maybe hate is a strong word, Okay. But what I struggle with, um, and it speaks to something that we kind of discussed before, but what I really struggle with in this business is um, the idea that it's never enough, that um, if you're ambitious, which you have to be to sort of sustain this career, um, that when you're in a job, you're always looking towards the next job. Um, as soon as you get that gig, you have to sort of plan for the next gig. You have to like keep lining up your ducks and, and keep planning for the future, which um, is the sort of antithesis of being in the moment yeah. and being in the now. Um, and, you know, it's just really hard not to be goal oriented and not to, to look to the results and to like stick with the process because the career doesn't lend itself to that. You know, you have to, continually prove yourself over and over again. Whereas in like most people's jobs, you know, one job that gets another job, you know, like you build that thing. But with our line of work, you have to continually prove yourself over and over and over again. So I think that's what I would say I, I struggle with the most is, is that idea that like, it's never enough. And, and when I've worked with like older actors who are really successful and famous and, you know, you would never think that they're like jealous or competitive with their peers, but they are. And, you know, maybe other than Meryl Streep, like they're all looking at someone else mm -hmm. and they're saying, I wish I had their career, like even in their 50s, 60s and 70s. And that makes me sad because I don't like that. I don't mm -hmm. like the idea that I'll always be like wanting the next thing or, you know, I hope that you know, you, you dream about like competition kind of fading away or like that anxiety, that hunger for what's next or that ambitious thing to just settle down a little bit. Um, but yeah. Yeah. It doesn't sound like it will. I've thought about that a lot too. <laughs> it it feels like sad. this might be a, a similar struggle for you. Yeah. I, um, Austin gets on me about this all the time about never really just uh, living in the moment and always thinking yeah. towards the next and the next. And it's something I've struggled with a lot. And it, it, you know, I am proud to be ambitious. 
Like you yeah. said, I don't think you can really succeed in this career without some bit right. of ambition, whether you pronounce it and it's very, very clear to everyone you're ambitious or if you hold it close to your heart. I think right. we all have quite a bit of ambition. And right. um, I, uh, oof. Yeah, it is a struggle. I mean, we could we could talk about it being happy for others or not, or, you know, yeah, there's a lot to say. But anyway, we are talking about you, not me. And uh, <laughs> so the next question is something I like to ask everyone. It's just a silly question. So don't you don't okay. have to take it to heart at all. But in the cast of SpongeBob, yeah. who would you slap? Who would you hug? And who would you take to lunch? Oh, that's a good question. That's fun. Um, I would slap Ethan. <laughs> okay. Immediately. Immediately. <laughs> that would bring that would bring me a lot of joy. <laughs> Just a hard, clean slap across Ethan Slater's face. <laughs> um, who would I hug? I really miss Danny Skinner. He played Patrick, right? and he was such a good hugger. There's a lot to hug. It was really cuddly. Um, I miss him. And uh, who? What was the last one? Who would you take to lunch? Oh. You know, I, I miss my little sis. Uh, Jalen Josie mm -hmm. uh, was like, I, she, I took her under my wing and really was sort of, a, she called me her big brother. And we, we had many uh, private lunches and dinners, just the two of us. Um, and I, I, I miss her a lot. So, so I would say, I would say Jalen and I would take a field trip to Applebee's or something in Times Square, <laughs> a few blocks from, Pal from the palace, and we would get some buffalo wings and <laughs> celery and, you know, blue cheese and all that. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of that, thank you for answering that question. That's so fun. That I'm glad you liked that question. Yeah, um, that's fun. So if you all who are listening and watching us want to see more of Wesley Taylor, you can check him out on Indoor Boys at IndoorBoys.tv or on Amazon Prime, which is pretty, pretty cool. Or you can follow him on Instagram at Sir Wes Tay Tay to find more about what Wesley is up to and what he's doing during this time. Wesley, thank you so much for spending your time with us. I'm looking forward to the curtain call because I have a few more things I want to chat with you in there. And right. um, thank See you, you so then. much. See you then. Yeah. All right, Austin, play us out. <laughs>